So now I think we can begin. So hello everybody and thank you for participating uh, to this second uh, uh, webinar around legumes. I have the pleasure to manage uh, this well this uh, webinar with uh, Henrik Ogard Nielsen from Ruck in uh, Denmark. And uh, we'll, he will be the timekeeper uh, at the beginning and will uh, manage the final discussion, the broader discussion at the end of the, uh, of the webinar, where uh, we hope that you will be active in spite of the visio organization. So just as an introduction, uh, we know that we, we all know that we have a, a large uh, range diversity of legumes that can be grown in Europe. Uh, as pulses or forage legumes, such uh, here are some examples. And these various legumes can be grown in various ways in cropping systems, uh, as uh, cash crops uh, within longer ro rotation, as intercrops, as cover crops or double crops, uh, as a service crop uh, with another non-legume cash crops or as cash crop with non-legume service crop as service crop in relay cropping, as a permanent or semi-permanent cover crops and as cover crop becoming a cash crops. But, uh, uh, and we also know that legumes provide numerous ecosystem services to uh, cropping systems, such as decreasing uh, the nitrogen fertilizer requirement or use, both on legume and on the subsequent crops thus reducing the nitrogen fertilizer in the crops and in the rotation. It also allows to increase the yield of the subsequent crops and also to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions to compared to fertilized crops. It also uh, leads to increased nitrate leaching, which is not uh, services, but this, this service can be controlled by cover crops. It also, uh, legume can also help to decrease fossil energy consumption and also to control weeds and soil pathogens at the rotation scale, leading to a reduction in pesticide use. And also it increases the grown biodiversity in the landscape, thus helping to reduce the population of uh, airborne uh, uh, pests. And also they have a key role in associated biodiversity in the air and in the soil. But despite all these ecosystems, interesting ecosystem services, legume areas have strongly decreased and areas are still low in Europe. Here you have the pulses areas in Europe. And, uh, but uh, we also know that uh, farmers still grow legumes. Some farmers still grow legumes and they are happy with that. And we wondered in the Lake Value project, we wondered how do, did they grow them, why they are happy with, the, with this legume. And we had this on-farm network, uh, networks uh, trying to understand and to analyze how farmers uh, deal with this legume. So in this webinar, we will present different uh, examples. Uh, first, uh, will present examples of growing legumes in five countries in Europe, uh, Faber bean in Denmark, chickpea in Portugal, lentil in Italy, pea in UK and soybean in the Netherlands. Then we will have a small uh, short coffee break and then we will have other presentation about the decision support system for legume and then presentation on ecosystem services provided by legumes from the review and then uh, legumes in intercropping uh, coming from other projects, European projects, and then a presentation on current and future yields for legume across Europe, and then the presentation on uh, legume benefits at European scale, and then a uh, small uh, introduction of the general discussion where we hope that we will have time to discuss and before the final conclusion. So uh, enjoy your webinar, and now I give the, the talk to Inga. Thank you. I stop, I change, Inga. 
Yep. Yes. I think Inger, you can have your presentation yeah. on uh, organic cyberbin in Denmark. And now I'm wondering if I'm showing the right screen. No. We see your emails. <laughs> Okay. Not yet. Yes, that's right. So you can, can put in full screen, yes. And I think it will be okay. Oh, we can see the second, uh, the following, um, slide but i don't know if you can change that or not it's trying to change the screen no it will show the wrong screen hmm. Uh, Inga, maybe you can um, suppress the second desktop. This happens most of the time when you have two desktops. This, I take the opportunity because I forgot to thank very much also Martin Ward for uh, all technical support for this uh, webinar and also Frédéric Muel for his support in the organization of this webinar. Thanks to both of them. Well, maybe, Inga, I think maybe we can it's okay. Do... Inga, I yes, think you yes, can just start. It's okay. Inga. Yes, perfect. Oh, that was perfect. Yes, perfect. Yeah, but now you've seen the right one, isn't you? Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Let's go. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I'm going to give a short, short presentation on, on the fabric being growing in Denmark and uh, with the main focus on the organic growing. And uh, I start out with this uh, graph showing the growing area of faba beans in Denmark. And as you can see, it has increased uh, during the last 10 years. Especially, it has increased uh, um, in the organic, uh, starting earlier than in the conventional, but also in the conventional. And as you can see, uh, we actually had quite a big area in 2018. But uh, unfortunately, we had a drought, and that's the reason why it's dropping for the, the year after. And you can see it's dropping more for the conventional than the organic, and that's because there was a lot of new uh, growers that, uh, well, had faba beans for the first year, and then we had the drought. So, in, in fact, the, the interest for growing faba beans in organic farming in Denmark is, uh, is quite stable. Um, and that's um, that's good. Um, you can see here, still, it's only being a, a minor crop uh, in the organic uh, compared to what we are growing of other crops. Uh, and of course, in Denmark, uh, the organic uh, farming, we do have a lot of dairy farms, which means that uh, growing clover grass is uh, the absolute uh, major crop in Denmark. Uh, so um, you can say that faba bean has been uh, reintroduced in, in the Danish farming. Uh, it has been grown before uh, in the 80s. There was quite an area. Uh, but the reason that it has been reintroduced is that we have got new varieties that ripen earlier. It's a problem in Denmark that uh, previously the, the varieties were just uh, much too late and, and older farmers talk about uh, having to harvest uh, when the frost stopped the, the growth of the plants. But now we can harvest in, in September, sometimes in, uh, in August even. And then there's uh, an, an interest for growing local protein to substitute soya, especially in, in the organic farming. And uh, based on that, uh, we made projects uh, where we at the same time had trials on how to optimize the growing and also had trials on 
how to feed the different types of animals with the fava beans. And, and this has been do, done both organic and conventional. And these two things that happened at the same time actually made it possible both to grow the fava beans and for the farmers to sell them and use them. And uh, now it's mostly used for, for cattle uh, in the organic, but in the conventional, actually fava beans are used quite a lot for the pigs as well. Uh, and normally, or uh, before the, the trials, there was not a, a recommendation to use uh, fava beans, and now there's. So that's very important for the farmer that we get this um, things work together. And then we have some of the bigger companies in Denmark that are interested in reducing the import of soya, and that's also very important um, when it comes to to well uh, growing. Of, uh, of the fava beans. The, the, for the latest years, we have not been doing that many trials, but have been working a lot with the farmers. Uh, and, and we have tried to put up very simple rules for, for the growing of organic fava beans. So you have these bullets where you say to the farmer, you have to have these considerations. And, and every time, we have talked about fava beans, we take these bullets. And, and if a farmer says something went wrong, we take these bullets and then we talk, uh, well, did you do this? Because um, it's, of course, the problem with fava beans and other grain legumes that uh, they are not that robust and we have uh, sometimes uh, uh, not good enough, enough yields. But we know actually very well now how to grow the fava beans. So if the farmer is just following these rules, then uh, it'll go uh, very well. Uh, and actually we do have farmers that are very excited for growing fava beans. I'll not go through this list because I think it would be the same uh, from all of us, uh, but it's just the way of communicating it very simple to the farmer. In Denmark, um, the uh, organizations uh, are working for new strategies now and uh, in our uh, organization they have made an, a new strategy for the next three years and um, it is one of the strategies is they, that we are going to be working towards stop of use of non-European soya for organic livestock in 2025 and uh, use at least one third of the protein content in um, in um, is from Europe in uh, 2023, and at the same time, uh, also pushing for more Danish uh, feeding in, at uh, organic uh, cattle and uh, monogastric animals, and and things like this, and the case that the farm the the companies also want to have less uh, soya means that there's a lot of pressure uh, on, on the growing area uh, of fava beans and it'll increase uh, in the coming years as well. Um, you can say in, in the leg value project, uh, we had this um, uh, uh, focus on the fava beans, but uh, the arable farmers uh, in general wants to grow more grain leg legumes. Uh, and there's an, um, an increased interest for, for plant-based foods. And uh, in that case, it's also interesting if it, it's possible to use the fava beans for that purpose, as it is right now, the most um, uh, interest from the consumers and the companies is regarding peas, but uh, in some cases, fava bean can be used as well. And because the farmers are so interested in this area, in the leg grain uh, um, legumes, uh, we have also looked at other and new crops in, in the leg value. And just to show you, we have the fava beans as number four here, no, number three, uh, it's in Danish, sorry, uh, the, the fava bean fuego. And then we have tried to look at other uh, grain legumes to see how they perform. And it looks actually very well that there's new possibilities because 
we need to have more different uh, grain legumes than just faba beans, also due to, to soil-borne diseases. One of the things you cannot see from this, but on, in the next one, is how different they are in ripening. And again, this is very important when we're in Denmark, that we ha actually do have uh, ripening, so we can uh, um, harvest them early enough. And as you can see here, we have the faba bean at the one end still being green, uh, and you can see the soya bean, uh, well, uh, very unmature un and things like that. So, so that's one of the things we're working on now, how to introduce, introduce other grain legumes than faba beans, because we actually find if we have the market, uh, we have a stable production of faba beans in Denmark. Uh, so it's interesting to look at others as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you uh, Inga. Yeah. <clears throat> I think... Um... The next presentation is uh, Carlos from uh, Portugal, and I think that's a video. So please, could you start the video? So Martin, you have the, the hand to, to launch the video. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just, I'll just load that up for you now. Good morning. My presentation is about the chickpea farm network in Portugal. I represent AECF Agroinovação. So, chickpea crop is important for animal and human consumption, but also are highly relevant for agricultural system and soil conservation. It allows the diversification of crop rotation, interrupt disease cycle, contribute to weed control, improve soil structure and promote the fixation of atmospheric nitrogen as a result of the symbiotic association of their roots with the bacteria rhizome. With this, it has been possible to practice sustainable agriculture with a reduction in inputs, namely as the application of fertilizers and plant protection products for weed and pest disease control. In Portugal, chickpea farm network have more than 50 farmers spread throughout the Alentejo regions. 60% of him are in integrated production. 30% uh, in conservation agriculture and 10% uh, in uh, organic agriculture. There are some important practices to implement and guarantee a good yield. Theref therefore, before sowing, chickpea crop have good resistance to low temperatures and capacity to grow with rainfill ranges between uh, 150 and uh, 1000 millimeters. With regard to soils, the main limitations are associated to their chemical composition, water retention capacity and internal drainage conditions. So, it's very important, the soil, uh, medium to heavy texture, texture uh, thickness uh, greater than uh, 50 centimeters, and the pH uh, between uh, 6.5 to uh, 70.5 or 8 uh, uh, of the, the, the pH. Since, and uh, the um, chickpea crop have a sensitivity uh, uh, to uh, salinity problems. Avoid uh, hydromorphic soils, this is very important, and areas with water accumulation in winter. Preferably uh, select verti soils, which are soils with a high potential use. Uh, so, uh, the sowing preparation, uh, the soil cultivation uh, using uh, vertical uh, tillage machi machines for better uh, soil preparation. The soil surface is subsequently tilled uh, to break up clods. 
uh, for a farm with, with the soil conservation techniques, chemical weed control should be carried out sowing uh, weed uh, directly sowing machine. Application of fertilized egg sowing, 30 units of nitrogen, 70 uh, units uh, of uh, phosphorus, uh, and 30 uh, units of uh, potassium for uh, productions of more than uh, 2,000 uh, kilos uh, per uh, hectare. Seed placed at th uh, th uh, three to four centimeters deep, uh, density about um, 150 um, kilos per hectare, uh, and uh, between rows is 20 to 25 centimeters. After sowing, uh, an application of residual herbicide should be carried out. Weeds may ca cause losses of more than 70%. Monitor uh, the development of the crop, knowing that in March, April, the weather conditions, temperature and humidity are favor favorable to the uh, appearance of um, a disease uh, caused by a fungus is called Escochite rabiae. When the first symptoms are detected of on the leaf margins, apply the fungicide. In May, traps are set with specific pheromones for the control of the main harmful pest in production. It's called helicover parmiger. If the number of adults in the trap is high, uh, insecticide should be applied. Uh, economical level uh, of attack, uh, it's very important to uh, see this in fields. At the end of June, uh, the plant, the plant uh, begins to senescence. Harvesting takes place when the humidity, uh, the grain is less than uh, 13 uh, percent. Uh, above uh, this uh, slide, we can see pictures. Um, on the left, uh, a picture with uh, weeds not controlled in the field. So you can see Gramenia uh, family uh, in weeds uh, and broadleaf weeds too. Uh, next, a uh, picture with plant damage by Helicover parmigere. Uh, we can see holes uh, in, in the veins. Uh, then uh, a larvae uh, in, in the capsule. You can see a, a depreciation uh, in the product. If, and before uh, we have and after we have uh, plant damage by ashkokita in the in the um, in the seeds and the and the and the veins too. Uh, so uh, on this clip, some photos of the production cycle uh, of the crop. Uh, we can see on the uh, germination and the uh, emergence stage. Uh, next, uh, vegetative uh, development, uh, the flowering stage, and the fructification stage, the filling of the pod, and finally, uh, we can see the final, the final product. In, a, in webinar three, legume-based uh, value chains, farm gate, and the market behind, I will take. Uh, I will talk about the organization of a chickpea value, value chain in Portugal. Thank you. In Portugal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, who could not attend uh, this uh, webinar. I didn't tell you that if you want to ask questions, we have no time for that, but you can ask questions in the question uh, in the chat and then uh, and then uh, the presenter could uh, answer you. So now we have Elisa uh, dealing with the opportunity of lentil in Italy. Uh, Elisa, yes, now. You can present your slides, I think. Yes.
Elisa, I don't know if you speak, but we cannot hear you. <laughs> Maybe you have not your microphone. I cannot see that. Martin, can you hear Elisa or can you see if she has uh, her microphone open? I can I can see um, that she's unmuted and um, so I'm not sure if she's, she might be having another problem. Okay. Um, maybe yeah. we can, maybe like we can add some technical issues so it may, maybe, maybe we can return to Elisa's presentation. But okay. now maybe you hear me? No. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. 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 So, so let's go. Elisa. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello. Um I I'm Elisa, so from Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa. And at the beginning of this project, I I worked with a non-farm network in uh, Apulia, in the south of Italy. And this network is producing lentils and it has a quite interesting uh, innovative potential. And so let, let's see its story and, and functioning. Uh, the network is located in Puglia, so in the south of Italy, and also partly in Basilicata, a neighboring region. In more in particular, uh, the network is located in the so-called Murge area, that is a specific, uh, uh, like it is a karst plateau, very rich in calcareous rock and very draining soil. And it is also a national park. And in this park, not all the, the area that you see in green is a national park, but most of it is the national park. And in this park, uh, these lentils are grown. Everything started in 2014 when a group of uh, people that are were academics from uh, national research institutions and universities, farmers, farmers cooperatives that were acting as collectors from the farmers, seed companies and packagers, decided to to question the dominant system based on wheat and proposed an alternative lentils that were a traditional crop in the region, very famous in the past. And they saw the opportunity to open a market niche based on this, on this uh, crop. And so these people uh, created a consortium and in 2016, they obtained the level of protected geographic indication for their lentils. And so Lenticchia di Altamura started. Today, the network is composed by almost 200 farms that confer uh, their product with uh, two, um, some two cooperative farming, farmers cooperatives that so as the role of collectors. Uh, these cooperatives are always in communication with uh, a seed company and a packager. And they, together with the consortium, they have a strong bargaining power on the market because they represent so many farmers. So they can set a good price and the consortium even give back the surplus based on the original price to the farmers because the consortium is a non-profit organization. The products are sold all over Italy in the large-scale retail distribution and also in Europe. And just to have an idea, last year, so in 2020, the price of Altamura lentil 
overcame that of the lentil, the, the domestic market of lentil in Italy by 250%. That means that uh, a ton of Altamura lentil was sold for 2,000 euros compared to 800 euros of um, non-labeled lentil in Italy. Concerning the agronomic point of view, lentils are often included in a two or three year rotation based on wheat that still remain the main production in the region. So the management is sometimes organic, sometimes slow input or conventional. There are defined uh, shares that varies according to the year and the necessity of the market. And sometimes it's possible to see also uh, forage in the leg leg forage legume in the rotation but not very often because they are not very rewarding. So lentils, Altamura lentils, are famous for their nutritional values, especially proteins and iron are very high because the soil where these lentils are grown confer them these characteristics because it is uh, very vocated. And this is also the reason why in the past it was so famous. The soil, just to have an idea, sometimes looks like that, not always, but quite, quite common. And it is calcareous, very rocky and very draining. From a scientific point of view, the consortium has a constant activity. Sometimes they organize collective field trials on the farms and technical meeting with input suppliers. And this is this has the, the, the objective to trigger discussion and exchange between the network uh, members, enhance the networking uh, uh, capacity of them and tie their bond, and also try unknown uh, techniques. For example, they worked a lot on biostimulators. They did uh, several trials in different farms of members of the network. And uh, at the end, they could introduce the, this new practice in, in, the, in the lentil cultivation. But another very interesting uh, activity is that regarding the genetic um, research on Altamura lentil. At the beginning, Altamura lentil protocol was based on two Canadian varieties, Eston, a small one, and Laird, a big, medium one. Why that? Because the original Altamura lentil genotype was not suited for modern cultivation, because in the past, when this lentil was abandoned, around the 60s, 70s, there was not yet a genetic improvement uh, for mechanical cultivation. So, the consortium decided anyway to, to go deeper in this topic and they collected Altamura strains from gene banks, uh, Altamura strains that were given to gene banks in the 60s. Then they multiplied and selected these materials in uh, pitotrons to have uh, faster cycles, more cycles in the year, and then in field trials. And finally, after two years of activity, or maybe three, now in 2021, they are gonna register large green, a medium green, and a red uh, Altamura strains. So coming from the original Altamura lentil, no more from foreign varieties, they are gonna register them in the protocol of the PGI. And this is gonna be a very interesting. Uh, story if they succeed because it is not so common to to sustain such a genetic um, research in short time. So that's all from the Altamura Lentil PGI. Thank you for your attention and thank you from the network. Thank you very much, Elisa. So now I give the the talk to Becky from uh, the UK. Uh, yes. So 
Becky, you can go, I think. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully you can see my full view slides, can you? Not yet. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's on viewer show rather than presenter. <laughs> yeah. Good. Thank you. I'm going to talk um, about the um, UK Vining Peas on that one. Um, the, the, the way that this is organised is, is a little bit different from pulses in the UK. The vining pea groups are organised as cooperatives, so it's actually naturally inclined to, to be able to form a farm network relatively easily. And this was very focused um, and started five or six years ago, really to look at soil health. And the reason for that is that vining peas are grown in these cooperative groups close to the factories down the eastern side of the UK. So they have to be within 150 minutes from field to frozen. Hence what happens is we get quite intensive production of peas in some areas and this has led to um, you know, ensuing soil structural issues and issues with disease. So we've worked with quite a few groups, Swaythorpe Growers, the Green Pea Company who grow for bird's eye, HMC peas and stem gold peas, as well as some of our other partners. And um, the overriding objective, hopefully this is moving on, yeah, was really to use sustainable land management techniques and IPM to improve productivity and specifically really looking at improvement of soil health and the reduction of losses from pests and diseases. And there's a couple of strands to this, although we have quite a lot of work going on with the vitamin P network, I'm just going to focus a little bit today on, on the, the cover crop work and also the IPM. So we looked at the use of cover and catch crops to try and correct and protect soil structure for farmers, um, to relieve compaction, to improve soil moisture behaviour and to suppress disease. These are really high value crops, finding peas, so it's really important that growers are able to get this right. There are other benefits, of course, um, to having cover and catch crops in rotations, particularly looking at farm habitats, um, the retention of nitrogen, and an improvement of nutrient availability and the prevention of erosion and pollution. Plus, obviously, carbon benefits that can be gained from having cover crops in rotations. But farmers were a little bit concerned as well about the potential for increasing levels of pests and diseases where cover crops have been in rotations. So specifically, really, I suppose, having other legumes in cover crops might lead to increases in foot rot disease in particular, plus also having higher levels of organic material in crops has some potential for increasing a particular pest, which is the Delia platura, which is the bean seed fly. There was also concerns about sowing issues with trash and crop contamination, neither of which were a problem. So we looked at black oats as a really strong basis for our cover crops, vetch as um, cover crop only, just to examine the impact that that might have on foot rot disease in particular. But seeing clover as well, or radish, Cecilia and buckwheat, and, and buckwheat was a cash crop only. We laid the, the work out with the, where the farmers did actually, and they drilled large strips of cover crops, followed by peas, of course, after the cover crop was destroyed in January and February. And then perpendicular to those strips of cover crops, we laid out also um, the catch crop so that we had some overlapping treatments. So we had individual covers and catch and then overlapping treatments to give a good effect and um, that worked really well. What we saw actually overall, I think, and this is just one example, is that the yield was improved, particularly with the oat and clover mixture, but with the oat mixtures and cover crops are generally compared to, I'll go back to the previous picture, you can see a cover, no cover area. The weather control, which had no cover crop on it, um, was in place, yields were much lower. Custom treatments were the ones that were selected by the growers themselves, and they generally performed quite well. Also, what we saw was a really good effect on nutrient retention in the top part of the soil profile by using cover crops. So you can see here again, intensive and universal of the oat and oil radish mixtures with the seam clover as well in the universal. But these, these are showing that in the top 30 centimetres of soil, we saw really good nitrogen retention, but not where we had no cover crop. So where you can see here, we had no cover crop in the control treatments, nitrogen was leaching down into the lower parts of the soil profile. Um, 
And also soil moisture retention was very good where we had oats and clover in the mixture. And you can see throughout the season, we've got higher levels of moisture retention where we had a cover crop in place compared to no cover crop. And it was really quite a strong relationship where, between moisture retention at sowing here, where this red dash line is, and at pod fill. Um, we've got quite strong relationships between that improvement in soil moisture retention. And we saw very quickly as well, um, after just a year actually of cover cropping, some big improvements just in the visual appearance of the soil. So on the right, you can see where you've had the senior cover crop. Soil structure is much better, root development is better, and there's no layers in the soil there, so it's, it's much more friable um, and it's a significantly improved structure. And actually also, overall, we saw a reduction in the soil-borne infections in peas following cover crops. So where you can see your control strip here, an increase in foot rot infection, which then led to lower yields. And, and you can see these lower levels of foot rot infection where you have got cover crops in place, which again is really related mostly to improvements in soil structure, which, um, which allow um, the peas to grow better and the foot rot pressure to be much lower. Finally, we have looked with a separate part of the key network at this particular pest, which is Delia platura. There were concerns that with higher levels of organic material in soils and, um, and trash, that this might be more of a problem for peas. It's a, a pest that attacks the crop at a very early growth stage, so when the seed are imbibing water and, and seedlings are emerging. And it can lead to really quite large losses in peas and beans and other crops like spinach and maize as well. Um, and it's the larvae that does the damage. So you can see here the larvae feeding on the seed and tunneling and it tunnels in the stem and kills the crop. So what we looked at was we did a survey for two years so far with another part of the pea network um, looking at how farm operations impacted on this particular pest. And one of the things that really stood out was the period between cultivation and sowing. So this pest is very attracted to um, freshly disturbed soil. Um, so we looked at that in more detail. We could see that the longer the period between cultivation and sowing, the, the, there was a greater reduction of damage. And we did some new plot work in 2020 to, to examine that further. And we can see that we get quite significant reductions in damage where we leave a gap between cultivation and sowing, which is not usual for growers to do, but obviously it's it's an excellent way without any chemical control of, of managing this pest better. We are doing other work with other parts of the vining pea network. For instance, we're looking at the prediction of maturity and yield for vining peas and improving that so that factory throughput is improved. Um, so if there's any, if you like any information about any of the other work that we're doing, either in peas or beans, then you can contact us directly. And there's a full report of the cover crops work on the leg value site now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Becky. So now the last uh, on-farm opportunity presentation by uh, Chris, the visitor from Bur. Uh, Chris, Chris, yes. So you have uh, the hand, Chris, I think now. I hope it works. So far, I have no screen in front of um, I don't know how this works, but do I need to do something, Martin? No, no, I think you, you, we can see your screen. You can put in full screen and you are not on the first uh, slide. Mm, like this? Yes, yes. Can you see it now? Yeah. And then yeah, in okay. <clears throat> no, yes. So, okay. And I'll, I'll start this um, about, um, my talk is about uh, a pilot on soybean in the Netherlands. And uh, in this pilot, we um, had the role of uh, crop research on uh, yield, uh, maturity and protein content. Um, <clears throat> the initiative of this uh, pilot was taken by um, a large uh, uh, cooperative of farmers called Agifirm. Um, and this is also a, um, a, a uh, a company that uh, buys a lot of soya products from the world market to produce compound feed products. Um, but you know, there is a, a, a large pressure on uh, the sustainability of uh, these soy imports. 
So this uh, company is involved in, uh, in a round table of responsible soy, uh, but they also created a, a position of uh, a corporate social responsibility in the company. And this um, uh, um, uh, part of the company took the initiative for the, to find an alternative for import soy. And, and they, they tried um, uh, some alternatives and their co main conclusion at that time was uh, the best uh, replacement for import soy is European soy. And based on that, they um, uh, uh, made an ambition, they uh, put an ambition forward of uh, growing 10,000 hectares of soy in the Netherlands. That might not seem much to you, but in the Netherlands, that would uh, seem to be uh, rather large. But they also said, um, uh, we want a yield between three and a half and four and a half tons per hectare. We want the maturity in September. We want the crop to have a firm stem so it doesn't fall over. And we uh, need the um, seeds to have a protein content of 42% or more, and it should be non-GMO. So that was the, uh, uh, the task for us uh, when we started. Um, now, maybe, uh, uh, th this uh, slide is um, it is in Dutch and it's not for you to read. You may if you want, but I'm only wanting to put your attention to the figure on the on the right hand side, 529 uh, uh, 529 euros 75. That was a price that Arifirm uh, realized for the farmers for soy. Now, if you uh, produce about three tons or three and a half tons of soy, you get a turnover, which is uh, higher than for winter wheat. So at that time, we thought, OK, um, that, that, that 10,000 hectares is within reach. Uh, why it is did not uh, work out the way, I will uh, um, uh, tell you at the end. Uh, our activities, um, so we, we started to, to look for um, um, uh, knowledge abroad. Yeah, which is also important just to try to see uh, who knows more about soy than you do and uh, of course at the beginning there were many people um, uh, we did um, we cooperated uh, especially with the uh, ilvo in, the, in belgium we did variety trials uh, nitrogen uh, protein trials uh, we monitored commercial fields and that is uh, also interesting um, uh, agri firm did research on one uh, on one hand and on the other hand and they tried to uh, get as much as uh, commercial fields as possible. So it was a parallel oper oper operation. So the results of the, of the research fed into the uh, commercial fields uh, project. Um, and we did at least a, a little research about protein content and uh, maybe the result uh, beforehand. We found it uh, astonishing that was, there was very little uh, to be found on, the re on, on how the protein content is um, uh, realized within the soya and how uh, uh, all kinds of uh, um, external factors are influencing this. Mostly it is only, the only relation is with, uh, um, with uh, the variety. Now we visited uh, Germany, Austria and Canada. You see some pictures of that. Uh, we learned a lot from that. Um, uh, uh, from these uh, visits, um, because especially in Canada, there was a lot, uh, a large history of uh, growing soy, um, and they also um, uh, exported soy to the Netherlands for human feed products. As, as I said, we cooperated with Ilvo on the varieties and rhizobium research, and that also uh, made it, uh, uh, so we realized in, in um, in uh, advancing more quickly. Now, this, these are variety trials from 2014 and to 2018. And you see here um, uh, the protein content uh, in this graph and the yield. Uh, and I said we, we want a protein content of 42% or above and a yield of uh, three and a half to four and a half tons. And in, in the red triangle, you see the uh, amount of uh, uh, varieties in a specific trial that reached that um, uh, goal, but you see that a lot of them were outside that goal. So th there was a lot uh, to be done. Um, and uh, we started uh, to work on protein content at a certain point in time. Uh, this is the result of one uh, trial. We did many more, but we, we tried to um, increase the protein content with extra rhizobium uh, um, applications and a late nitrogen application. 
um, you can see the, the yields and, and the protein content, and there was a better protein co uh, content. Uh, you see um, uh, a protein content of 42.6, which is good. Um, uh, when we had an overhead application of rhizobium, at least on the 1st of July. And that, of course, is interesting. And it is interesting because we noted in the field that um, uh, 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 in any cases, some plants did not have even rhizobium knobs. Uh, others did. Uh, so we started to, to look at these. Um, uh, we did some rhizobium nodes count per plant um, and you see that the yield increase and the protein content increase if you have more rhizobium nodules per plant and i think uh, and there was a large variation in the in the number of plants that had and the number of plants that had not rhizobium nodules and that was um uh, i think uh, um, uh, the main thing to work on to uh, if you wanted to uh, improve protein content now, we also did monitoring on commercial field trials. You see here different years, the protein content and the yield. And you see we had no relation whatsoever between the two. Um, and you see in 2017, we had um, uh, different varieties. And those were varieties that we uh, identified in variety trials and then were introduced in commercial fields in 2017 and especially abelina alexa and obelix and atsoi was a uh, variety that was um, already on the market and uh, produced by ag firm but it was a, uh, a rather poor it was a very early variety but it was poor on yield um, now it, this is the monitoring of commercial fields so uh, you see the year on the left side the number of farmers that increased to from 2014 to 2018 now it is decreasing again i will explain why later on and the area gradually increased the area per farmer increased uh, and that was a sign of growing trust of farmers uh, a trust in in the price uh, and then the, the possibilities of the uh, uh, of the crop the yield was also increasing, but you see in 2018, a very low yield. And that was very surprising to us because 2018 was very dry. It was very warm and sunny, and that would reflect um, uh, conditions that would favor uh, soya, but it did not favor soya. We got low yields and we got even low protein contents. And that was also uh, a very interesting to see why is that the case so, so water availability of water uh, somehow um, decreased protein content um, now the status in 2021 this is my final slide um, the area is very limited at the moment only 100 to 130 hectares so it is has gone down um, the beans are still sold to, to alpo uh, so human uh, food um, and we saw a production shift from north to south. In the north, the yields were poorer. Uh, the protein content was more poor, and in the south, it was better. So um, uh, it is more produced in the south compared to the north. Um, what is interesting is that um, uh, from these, the first things that I said, that you would imagine that um, uh, 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 legumes are less popular in the Netherlands, but the, the, uh, op, uh, the opposite is true. There is a large project now going on in the north of the country called Fascinating. Um, and that is uh, an in initiative of AgriFirm, uh, a coast and beet company, and also AVB. And I want to focus on the latter, AVB, because it's a starch, a potato starch company. Um, and they um, uh, dominated the area, um, uh, asking farmers to grow potatoes. And at this point in time, they developed um, protein uh, um, uh, processing from the waste streams of the potato. And this protein concentrate is sold in the human food market at a very good price. And for AVB, the protein is now getting more and more important and more and more profitable compared to starch so and now they um, are interested in 
other um, uh, um, uh, protein sources um, when they cannot process um, starch potatoes anymore in the, and that's mostly from let's say uh, february march to uh, um, end of summer um, and this could be interesting because they have a, a good market for their protein concentrate and they can uh, sell it at good prices and that might do the trick uh, at the same time our government um, uh, put a, an ambition forward of 100,000 hectares of legumes in 2030 which I find very ambitious. Uh, I, I have doubts whether that can be reached. Um, and key uh, conditions, uh, if you want to reach it, is that there is processing of uh, two protein concentrates uh, grown in the Netherlands that, of course, uh, get a good price. And that the, there is a good margin for growth plus, and now um, uh, I want to stress the next thing is the rotational match. Why I'm saying this? Because we ask farmers, now I go back to what I said before in my uh, uh, talk, that farmers could get a, a good price, 530 euros per ton, which is good. You get a, 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 a return better than wheat. Yet farmers say, if I want to grow uh, legumes in my uh, rotation, they need not to replace winter wheat, but they need to replace other crops. And these other crops have higher margins. And these higher margins are important for farmers because the, uh, the, the soil is very uh, expensive. Just to give you an example, in the area where I live, you want to buy one hectare of land, you need to bring 130,000 euros. And that, of course, translates into a rent for farmers. And that is, of course, a burden that they need to match on the market with good prices and good products. And that um, uh, is um, the really the, the, the question standing in the way of um, uh, getting more uh, legumes in the, in the rotation. And I think that the fascinating project can play that role because a uh, buyer uh, has uh, found a way to produce protein concentrates at a good price for the human market. Okay, that Thank is you, um, Chris. Uh, what I need. Yeah. Thank Sorry? you, Chris. I think uh, oh. we should move on. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Marie Helen, I think we are, uh, it's excellent presentations. We're a little bit behind the schedule. I think. Uh, we should continue with uh, with uh, Anne Snyder and Bruno. I okay. think that uh, if anyone needs to stretch legs or make a little bit of uh, exercise, you have to stand. You can close your camera and you can stand up at home and jump a little bit around while you listen to another presentation. I think we have to stick to the program because we have uh, many excellent presentations also um, later on. So I think we should give the, the floor to, to Anne and uh, Bruno. Yeah. So Anne and Bruno, Anne, you have the floor now, I think. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, do you see my screen? No, not yet. We have just had. Um, oh yes. That's okay. Now put it in in full screen, maybe, and that's perfect. Yes. Yes, okay, thanks. Is it, is it okay like that? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, so good morning, everybody. So uh, on, uh, on behalf of my colleague from Leg Value Project, I am very pleased to present you the Leg Box. This is the, legume, the leg, leg Value Decision Support System to insert legumes in cropping systems. So why such a tool? In fact, the leg, the leg value partners, which uh, to set up a tool for facilitating the design of legume-based cropping systems, which can foster the expression of targeted ecosystem benefits in a specific agriculture situation. The objective is to uh, reach both agronomic and economic priorities and environmental services, but in real condition. So how to proceed? Um, the partners from Lake Value launched a questionnaire survey 
over the on-farm networks of flag value in order to get the farmer's legume services opinion and to better understand their demand, their constraint, and if possible, their measurement of the services. After the analysis of these uh, questionnaire surveys and uh, based also on the partners' brainstorming, decisions have been taken for the scope and the feature of this tool. It should be uh, devoted to the strategic decision and to support especially farmers and advisors. So field is a priority for the squad. It should get a multi-dimension approach. And we decided to uh, base it on a transnational prototype plus translation into operational tools with regional data. We decided to design this uh, tool by starting with the case of grain legumes based on the, on the principle of the lean up method in order to build a minimum viable product through uh, successive iteration. For that, we have defined a tool pathway in order to target a wide range of users profiles. The idea is to get um, to raise the awareness of people who have very little knowledge on legumes or, or are quite reluctant to legumes, but also to answer to people, to producers, which already know the crops, but wish to increase the number of crops uh, or wish to get further expertise in order to control them better. And this pathway, in this pathway, we see that the economic issue is a crucial point. The use of this tool should go to end to the decision of the users in order to grow the legume crops and we have a clearer idea of the way to make it relevant for his own situation. So we define this, uh, this uh, concept, this, this design, and we test this with a national panels of users and uh, to get their demands and their preference. This was done in four countries uh, up to now. So what is it exactly? What is the current stage of this tool? So you see that uh, these tools is based on six modules, which address six types of questions. The first section aims to give, get rid of preconceived ideas about legumes by sharing updated knowledge and farmers' testimony. The next one, is devoted to make people understand better the economic benefit of inserting a new legume crop in a given rotation. Then the two other modules help to choose within the range of possibility for the user's specific situation, which crops according to the soil and climates, which benefits according to my priorities in my situation. There is another section to inform the main existing outlet and market of this crop, and another section to access to further local support, contact, document, and specific tools. Here we are going to focus on the three interactive modules, which can use the possible uh, user data. So the first one is the, at least the the, the, the module dealing with economic interest aims to share this new paradigm. The real economic value of P, for example, is much, than, it's much higher than the single margin. In fact, what we call usually the crop margin is the yield multiplied by the market price, and the real value is up to 55 higher than that, but it's not yet in, in the accountancy for the P margin. Why is it higher than that? Because there is a set of ecosystem services that we have already speak about, both on the effect on the crop production after growing granigums, and also on positive externalities, which are useful for the society or the environment, and which are not in the price of this crop. 
So how to get this full value? First of all, is to try to favor and to know how to do that, to favor the optimal level of the services in real life conditions. And secondly, to value the effort as remuneration to, to pay farmers for the society services. So the tool will, here is the, an example of the output from these modules, the economic modules, after chosen uh, one of one type of analysis here is the optimized cropping system and one region here is the uh, Burgundy in France then the tool will display in a graph uh, the comparison between a dominant uh, regional cropping systems here it's uh, the we, we take the example of uh, wheat wheat barley rape in uh, Burgundy, and some alternative with legume crops. So in order to make this comparison, there is two levels, one with the rotation performances, and one is the way to present the legume crop full value, incorporating in the price and the value of this crop, all the benefits, which is in gray at the rotational level, and in uh, yellow and, and, uh, and green, uh, the minimum level that we could get for uh, some, uh, some services like mitigation, uh, climate mitigation and so on. This is an example. And the idea is to have option for the users in order to adapt some variable for, from this calculation and this graph. We could adapt uh, some, some variable like grain price, nitrogen unit price, pre-crop effect of legume over the following crop, carbon pricing, and so on. There is also another option, which is to reach the comparison between the two calculations in order to know if it's better to sell grain or to use it on farm for animals, including all the, the steps for getting the finished compound feed. So this is one example of, of uh, our output from this economic analysis module. There are, for the two other modules, um, the user is invited to fill a form in order to give more precision on his context, both on the farm context, so uh, the loca location, history, and type of production, and so on, and more, more details in the case he has already grown or is growing some grain legumes about the species and the output outlet. After having filling this information, the tools will provide him uh, a display on the feasibility, the technical feasibility first. So here it is the result uh, according to his situation about the technical feasibility for growing all the range of different uh, grain legumes. And here you will see the pointer, uh, which is showing whether the growing, growing this crop is either possible, possible with moderate risk, possible but with very risky, or not recommended. And uh, when there is some risk which are identified, they are explained. And they can also access to the value of the potential yield. Here it's uh, the intermediate value, and it, it could also get the minimum one, at least a low value and a high value of this potential yield. So, and the idea is also to share the knowledge. So, for example, to explain uh, when it go over the sign, the, the pointer, then the user can see the limiting factors which has been identified in this situation for each species and their hierarchy between the different limiting factors. The other modules dealing with the question which benefits according to my situation priorities. The idea of these modules, in fact, is to link the farmer's issues and priorities with the potential ecosystem services that could be provided by the grain legumes or by the system including grain legumes. So for that, the module will provide first 
uh, information and key figures about the socioeconomic sex related to cropping production, both at the environmental level and at the agroeconomic level, provide information about the different benefits you could get from the presence of a legume in my production system. And we have already speak a lot of the different uh, services, uh, ecosystem services, which are the source of these benefits. This will be a page per stakes or pair per services to provide information. And then interaction, uh, another part will be how to insert legumes and how to know that legume will meet my priorities. So here we have entered according to eight type of priorities, which is raised by farmers in, in general, whether it's either to answer a local outlets or to be, uh, to be paid for services uh, given to the environment or to the society, or whether it is mainly to reach again good performance for my dominant crops and so on. So here we will display a recommendation and show the expected benefits with a list of uh, um, presentation of the class for each services relevant for the priority per legume crops and situation. And there will be a filter when the, the user has already identified the legume specific, species candidates for his situation. So here is the stage where we are. What for tomorrow? In fact, a leg box is a, the kind of uh, the box, a circle for aggregating, aggregating several pieces of knowledge to reach farmers and advisors. Here we based the first version uh, on data and expertise, which are uh, from the work package, the other work package of this project, or from other projects, or from literature, or also from regional sources, according to the region or country which is concerned. And some idea of this uh, information will be illustrated in the following talks. This uh, circle has to be complemented collectively, first at short term to give to incorporate further expertise and data, especially about service value and their context variability, and also to include to incorporate the case of forage species and crop mixture at a medium term. Up to now, we will get only links to specific tools related to crop mixture tools because it was. Uh, not the focus of uh, leg value. So we think that it will be better to have information from the other European uh, project, for example, who provide some tools or also some for local expertise uh, in the different country. And at least, not the last, uh, the, the we need to uh, um, adapt this leg box at the national level or regional level in order to get operational tools linked with regional data and existing advisory ecosystems. For example, we are currently working on the translation of this tool into a French tool, a tool leg, which is currently in development and by uh, Terinovia and which will be tested at the end of this year with the panel of users and with other colleagues. And are you... So at the end, okay. uh, we think that uh, this tool um, is really open for collaboration and uh, it's uh, needed in order to reinforce legume-based information for agricultural transition. Thanks for your attention. And I think the question will be only in the chat or on the discussion, in plenary discussion. Thank you, Anne. And please, uh, to the audience, use the chat. Um, it will be answered directly or uh, during this uh, webinar or maybe later if if, uh, if we don't manage to answer right away. So um, please use the chat as much as you want. So, Anne, uh, would you please stop sharing your screen? And uh, Leonora is the next one. Yeah. And, and please uh, have a tight look at the time also. Um, 
dear presenters, because we are running a little bit low on time. So, so 10 minutes for Leonora. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, do you now see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Uh, if you put it in full screen now. Yes, perfect. Great. Okay. Oh, I hear a strange echo. Okay. I will get going. Um, yeah. I'm Lenora. I work at Lachningen University and I'm part of um, the Lake Value Project in the work package where we are trying to quantify the ecosystem services from legumes. Um, and as part of that work, we did a literature review to see what has already been studied on this topic. And what I'll present to you today is really a tiny snapshot of the most important messages from our literature review. Um, but this paper was recently published last month. So I just encourage you, if you, you want to look more into the data and um, have more nuanced analyses, to check out our, our publication. So what we did um, was we wanted to find out what's been studied and published on ecosystem service delivery from um, agricultural systems that have legumes included in them compared to similar systems that don't have the legumes. So this, this real comparison of what happens when you bring in the legume. And we created this framework for our review to find papers that did experiments in the field in Europe um, where a legume was used in some way and um, the effects were studied uh, in these various ecosystem service realms. So we thought that this was really important information to know um, as one of the labors for helping farmers overcome barriers to legume adoption. We know that there's a lot of social and uh, policy levers that can be implemented to help farmers, but also an important piece of helping them overcome barriers is to provide this agronomic knowledge of practices and impacts of introducing legumes. So we collected data from 163 articles that have been published. And this uh, framework here is all the information we collected from those papers. And this is our sort of main figure from our work. And I'll walk you through it step by step. What you see on the x-axis is the legume types that have showed up in the literature. So those are all the legumes that we see being studied. On the y-axis are the ecosystem services that have been studied for that legume. So when you use it like a matrix and you can combine the, the legume with the service, you'll see um, a shape at that intersection. And the size of the shape um, indicates how many published articles there are on that combination. So the bigger the shape, the more literature there is on that um, effect. And if you start at the bottom left corner, you see this large cluster of literature where there's a lot of studies being published on just a few legumes and a few ecosystem services. Um, so as an example, you see a pink square in the very bottom left between peas and yield which means that there are 60 studies that have been published on the, the impacts of peas in, included in a rotation on yield of, of following or companion crops. Um, yeah, the, the color and the, the shape also corresponds to the method with which the legume was included into the rotation. And it, it's, it's a heavy figure, but the, the main message is that the majority of the studies are looking at mixtures between um, cereals and grain legumes. So an important thing to look at is that there's this large empty white space as you move down from these four very um, prevalent legumes into the lesser known or sort of less popular legumes, you get less and less studies. And similarly, as you move up um, from very production oriented ecosystem services, things that have to do, for example, with um, the nitrogen fixing capacity of legumes and how that relates to protein content, et cetera. Um, you go up towards weed suppression, soil quality indicators, um, things that have to do with labor and energy use, and then finally pest suppression, disease suppression, and biodiversity at the very top, with just a handful of studies being published on the effects of legumes on those services. There's a big gap there. Um, to look a little bit deeper at what's in this database quickly, 
you know, again, this just shows the, the number of studies on each of these legumes. We've seen quite a few presentations now about other legumes that are not so studied in the, the scientific research. Um, we have these four main groups. And then we also looked at the scale at which the legumes are being studied. So whether it's um, looked at in the same season or the following season in a rotation or beyond. And we saw that the majority of, of the research is looking only within the same season. So the simultaneous effect of the legume on the crop next to it or nearby, um, or just one season beyond. So studies that go really farther into the rotation and look at the longer term effects are, are very much lacking. And similarly, most of the studies are done on the, the plot level. So like real agronomic study um, style where you have a small plot of a species or um, a mixture um, and not looking at the sort of the whole farm landscape or beyond in terms of the effect of the legume. So the majority, the vast majority is really just at this plot level. So um, that's a, a brief overview of the data. And I'll give you the, the key take home messages or conclusions and recommendations that we pulled out of this uh, review. And the first is that, as we saw in the previous presentations, the variety of legumes that are being grown by farmers um, and experimented with in these innovation networks is much bigger than what the research is focusing on. Um, so the first recommendation to us as researchers is to consider broadening our scope um, of what legumes we think are interesting and to take farmers' cues to um, better fit the studies to, to what people actually want to grow. Um, the second thing is that there's a huge gap in the, the literature on the effects of pest and disease, or sorry, the effects of legumes on pest and disease management um, at the farm level. And uh, recent studies in the leg value project specifically have found that farmers really want this information. Um, the, a survey that was done a couple years ago, farmers said that they wanted more knowledge on crop management in general to be able to grow legumes better or to incorporate them more effectively into their systems. And uh, pest and disease management was one of the things that they specifically called out as needing uh, that information. And here we have this big gap in the literature. So there's an opportunity to um, redirect research to fill that gap to help farmers. Similarly, um, we also saw that there were not very many studies at the long term or larger scale. And this is another thing that farmers said they wanted. Um, in the Diver Impacts project, which is a, a related project to lay value, um, we, some colleagues looked at uh, barriers to farmers for crop diversification in general, so legumes being one of the crop diversification methods. And they found that um, farmers really wanted evidence of the sustainability benefits of legumes or any kind of diversification um, at the farm level and at longer term scales. So here again, we have this big gap um, or mismatch between what farmers say they need to know and what the research is providing. And finally, the, the least studied uh, ecosystem service that we found, I think we found three papers that reported on biodiversity effects of legume inclusion. Um, this is uh, obviously a service that's becoming increasingly important to society and yeah, just globally um, more uh, getting more attention. And here we have um, a great opportunity to look at the potential for legumes to help with this service, um, but it's not being researched. So this is another gap that I think we should look at. And finally, just a, a little uh, motivational plug for why this is important to fill these gaps. Um, we know from other research on diversification and legumes in Europe that research trends, what, what we're doing as scientists, directly reinforces um, the practices and the markets and policy um, structures. So if we continue to look at a very narrow range of legumes and a very narrow productionist um, kind of reductionist view of what legumes can do, then we also uh, reinforce that kind of narrow productionist um, monocultural approach um, in markets and policy and practice. So here we have um, evidence that there's a lot more that we can look at for legumes and some good motivation to expand our research. And as I said, the, the paper was just published. It's open access, so anybody can read it and I encourage you to take a deeper look at your leisure. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Lenora, to give us some so large avenues for research. And so now I give the floor to uh, Ali. Ali, Ali, please. Uh, yes, I cannot see. Oh, yes, Ali. And I cannot see you in the list of uh, possible presentators. No, Ali, uh, Ali is. I can. I can see her. So she. Uh, uh, I just. Yeah. Um, uh, could you invite me to share my screen? So it sort of flashed up and then disappeared again. Ah, that's it. Martin, can you help us? It's all right. It's just come. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Can you see my screen now? My presentation. Uh, not yet. It. Oh yes. Yes. Now it's. Uh, that's okay. And is it in the pre presenter mode, not the notes node mode? Yeah. It's, per it's perfect, Ali. Okay, yeah. great. So, so thank you very much for the invitation to speak at today's webinar. My name is Alison Carley. I'm based at the James Hutton Institute in Scotland. And I was coordinator of the Diversify project, um, which also had a sister project called Remix, which is coordinated by Eric Just, who's based at Surad in France. Um, and both projects ran for four years. Diversify finished last month, Remix is finishing this month, and they were funded by the EU, and they had a focus on intercropping. Um, so I'm just going to give a bit of background about intercropping. You've already heard a little bit about it today, so apologies if, if I'm already telling you what you know. Um, what this talk is, is really to summarize what we've learned about how intercropping can support legume production. So why would anyone consider growing two or more crop species together? Well, the, some of the key, key reasons why the, this has been considered as a, a, a good a, a potential cropping practice is the um, fact that uh, if you look at the evidence in the literature across many different studies, that it can lead to increased yield per unit area, sometimes called overyielding. A metric that's often used to measure this is called the land equivalent ratio. And what this basically does is look at the yield of an intercrop, so the um, two, two or more crop species grown together, uh, as a ratio of the yield of those crops if they were grown in monoculture. And any value greater than one means that the intercrop has given a bigger yield per unit area of land than, than the crops grown in as sole crops or in monoculture. On this, in this review, which was published three years ago, looked at a number of different intercropping combinations grown across the world, many of which include legumes, and it presented the LER, land equivalent ratio, as a log value. So any value greater than zero means a greater um, yield per unit area of the intercrop. And you can see that for lots of different combinations, a greater yield was obtained when the crops were intercrop compared to when they were grown as sole crops. But overyielding isn't the only reason people might be interested in intercropping. <clears throat> there are other environmental and agronomic benefits that can, can result from intercropping, which includes things like better suppression of weeds and of pests and diseases, improved soil fertility and other soil quality characteristics, more efficient use of nutrients, and also when two or more crops are grown together, potentially reducing the failure of crop risk in any one growing season. More diverse crops can also support greater biodiversity in the cropping system of, of other organisms. So as I mentioned, the Remix and Diversify projects had a focus on intercropping. They did had uh, the greatest focus was on arable systems. And although there are many exa good examples of intercropping with um, legumes and perennial systems, the focus of this, what I'm presenting today, is in arable systems. And the way that these intercrops can be grown can vary widely, ranging from strip intercropping, shown here on the left, to sunflower and soybean, where the, um, the several rows of each crop species are grown alongside each other. Alternate row intercropping, where each alternate row in the, in the field is a different crop, or the crops are mixed together in the row, uh, as shown for this pea wheat um, example on the on the right hand side and then on the far right hand side a complete homogeneous mixture where a mixture of in this case cereals pea and Aussie rape have been broadcast into the field so 
Uh, sorry, just before I move on. That, so as I said, the focus of our work was on intercropping more generally. We weren't always specifically looking at intercropping to boost legume production, but some of the results that have emerged from our projects have shown how intercropping could be used to support legume production in Europe and further afield. And one of the um, potential barriers to growing legumes, and has been touched on in, in earlier talks, is, is, the, is the variability that can sometimes be experienced in legume cropping from year to year, the instability of the yield. And so that's one of the things that we looked at in trials that were conducted in the Diversify project. And what is illustrated here is a graph showing for two different types of intercrop, pea grown with barley and fava bean grown with wheat, grown across different locations in Europe. They were grown in two different growing seasons, 2017, which was a, a pretty good year, benign year for, for crop growing, and 2018, which was very hot and dry, at least in Northern Europe. And what we did was look at the difference in yield between those two growing seasons to see how stable the yield was. And what our findings showed was that, that intercropping had a yield stabilizing effect for pea. So if you see we, where these green arrows are pointing down, the red but filled bars show the difference in yield between the two growing seasons for pea when they're grown as intercrops, compared to the hatched red bars to the left of them when they were grown as sole crops. So growing pea as an intercrop stabilized their yield between these two growing seasons. Um, but this did, we didn't see the same effect for fava bean. We also saw that the identity of pea, the pea cultivar affected the degree of yield stability that we, we that was observed. So not only is yield stability a potential benefit of intercropping, but intercropping in gen, more generally is, is known to reduce, be able to reduce reliance on agrochemical um, inputs, particularly crop protection inputs. Um, so uh, crops grown as Crops when grown in intercrops are often shown to to have to be less susceptible, show lower incidence of, of diseases. And that's shown nicely in this meta-analysis on the left-hand side from the Remix project, where the, um, the authors looked at the incidence of disease on fab bean grown in, in intercrops and also the accompanying cereal crops compared to the when they were grown as sole crops. And any values that fall to the left of this red dotted line at zero show a lower disease incidence in the intercrops. And you can see that, that in general, the disease incidence was lower when intercrop compared to sole crops. Also, in some of the trials that were done in the Diversified project, we monitored various insect pests, an example shown here on the right for aphids. And you can see that for um, aphids on pea, the abundance is much higher on pea plants when grown in monoculture, the orange bars, compared to in mixtures, the blue bars. And this was seen both in high input and low input integrated management systems. Intercropping is also quite well known as a uh, a method for suppressing weeds and is particularly important for in, in this respect for legume production and for organic production systems. And we've got two examples here. The one on the left is from the Remix project showing the biomass of weeds in sole crop legumes plotted on the on the x-axis and in the intercrop on the y-axis. And all these points that these data points shown here fall below, below the line of equivalence, which means that the values are higher in the sole sol crop legume. So weeds and biomass is much lower when the legume is intercropped with a cereal. A study that was carried out for Diversify and the Diver Impacts Project, another project looking at diversification practices, looked at how for what how intercropping could be used to manage weeds in soybean crops. And this looked at a number of different intercropping combinations of soybean with various other crops and also two different sowing patterns across two years of study. And this study showed that compared to sole crops, which is this red, sorry, this black cross here and here, the weed burden in the soybean crops was significantly reduced in most circumstances when it was intercropped with another crop. There was a bit of a trade-off between the ability to suppress weeds and the uh, yield that was attained by the, by the soybean in the intercrop, but that um, could be ameliorated to some extent by using the alternate row intercropping sowing pattern when soybean was grown with sorghum and buckwheat. 
growing legumes with cereals and oil seeds, which is generally what has, we've, we've looked at in many of the trials carried out in these two projects, is, 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 is generally an approach that's used to improve the nitrogen use efficiency of the intercrop, of, of the associated crop because we know legumes have this special capacity to be able to take atmospheric nitrogen and convert it into a usable form. But it, as trials have also shown that when you intercrop a legume with a cereal or oil seed, that it, that can actually improve the nitrogen fixation capacity of the legume as well. So shown on the left-hand side here, um, this graph um, here, we can see that the amount, the percentage of nitrogen that the legume has derived from the air in the sole crop compared to the intercrop is generally higher in the intercrop. The points fall above the line of equivalence. <clears throat> and we also see that effect in this pea bar barley trial, intercrop trial that was carried out for the diversified project, that the percentage of nitrogen derived from um, air in pea was higher in the intercrop compared to the sole crop. But also intercropping inc increases the nitrogen use efficiency of the whole crop so that the cereal that's grown alongside the pea in the intercrop increases its uh, the proportion of nitrogen that it derives from soil, mineral nitrogen in the soil. So the overall nitrogen use efficiency of the system is increased by intercropping. And that um, has potential um, benefits for um, mitigating pollution. So at the beginning, I talked about, I showed an example from the literature of how intercropping has been shown to generally improve ye overall yields of um, arable crops or many different crop um, crop combinations. And we also saw this in, in our own trials in the Diversified Project. So on the table on the left hand side here, this are the, these are the data for the mean, the grain yields obtained from the pit, barley and pea intercrops and the wheat and fava in, intercrop trials that I talked about earlier in terms of yield stability. And you can see that the mean yield that we saw in those trials across both crop species is higher than what we would predict or expect based on the yields of those crops in monoculture. Looking at the um, land equivalent ratio again as a metric, and this we, we use this to look at the yield across all the trials that we've conducted in the four years of the, the diversified project. And we can see that often there are LER values higher than one, indicating better performance of the intercrop compared to the, the sole crops, but not in all cases. And we were interested to understand, well, what are the local drivers of uh, variability in the performance of the crop? And one of the things we discovered is that it, the LER value is, is associated with changes in the, it, with the average mean minimum, minimum daily temperature, um, but not interestingly with rainfall. And we're looking at this, um, we're look, exploring this in more detail to try and understand what the, the key drivers are, what the local conditions are that optimize yields um, over yielding. Interestingly, we also discovered that oats grown with legumes had a significant positive effect on the land equivalent ratio. All of these trials shown here included legumes uh, as a, in the intercrop. These types of benefits that, that can be achieved with intercropping in terms of yield, yield stability, um, and reduced inputs, um, and more um, better, more efficient use of nutrients can translate into um, increased profits. And this is an, an example from the Remix project, looking at lentil, lentils grown either as a sole crop or as an intercrop with wheat. And what they were able to show was that um, although a lentil yield tended to um, absolute yield was smaller when it was grown as an intercrop with wheat. The total yield, the grain yield of the wheat and the, the lentil crop was higher in the intercrop compared to the lentil sole crop. And because the wheat and the lentil grain had marketable values, the total value of that intercrop was higher for, um, compared to the lentil sole crop. So it did translate into increased profit for the farmer. So finally, just want to, to summarize some of the points that we've come across, we've collated from across our projects is that that um, although that legume cropping um, in, in general, but intercropping in particular, we think can deliver towards some of the uh, national and EU policy goals that we're currently aiming towards. And these are sitting under things like the farm to fork target strategy under the in the EU Green Deal, the EU protein plan by increasing the diversity of crops and supporting greater biodiversity in the agri agricultural systems, 
and um, supporting environmental policy in terms of reducing agrochemical inputs, supporting integrated pest management, and reducing reliance on external inputs. There are challenges, of course, and there's still plenty that we don't know. And, and I think what's come across quite a lot this morning and also in this talk is that we need better understanding of what the local conditions are needed to promote things like yield stability, improved yield, and better control of weeds, pests, and diseases in intercrops. We also need to know which crop varieties or characteristics perform better in intercrops compared to um, when these crops are grown as sole crops, which is generally what they've been bred for. And that type of information is starting to emerge from the diversifying remix projects. Also understanding how the soil microbiome might be managed through intercropping to boost some of the um, ecosystem services that we've heard about this morning. And how to measure intercrop performance. And it very much depends on why intercropping is being used. Is it to stabilize yields? Is it to improve quality? Is it to improve weed control? The land equivalent ratio is used very widely, but it doesn't capture all these different purposes of intercropping very well. And it doesn't capture the mechanisms that allow these outcomes to be achieved. And also acknowledging that precision farming and digital agriculture is um, is is a good way, that, uh, a good route in to boost the development of intercropping and adapting those um, tools to intercropping is is will be an important um, future step. But in order to these are sort of the scientific challenges. We know that there are policy and institutional challenges, societal challenges to, to address as well. And one of the constant um, themes that came up in our work was in relation how to best share knowledge between people who have who already know about intercropping and who have experience of it with those for whom it's a new practice. And also through advisory services who generally haven't been um, aren't, aren't very well versed with with intercropping compared to um, conventional approaches but also education throughout the agricultural education system from from students um, through to to experienced farmers and to and and also to in, increase the or create the infrastructure that promotes the adoption or facilitates the adoption of intercropping when it is a way forward for a particular farmer through policies and through institutional capacities that promote change across the supply and value chains also making sure that consumers are aware of these potential these farming approaches that might um, allow might enable them to cre create demand for products that come with a smaller environmental footprint. An example shown here on the right, this has come from the Diversify project. It's it's a cereal based product, I, I admit, but um, it shows how one of our partners has developed um, pasta and biscuit products from wheat um, based on their um, the fact that they were produced in an intercropping system with fava bean. So finally, just to conclude, we hope that the research that presented from the Remix and Diversified projects have provided some good examples of how intercropping could help boost legume production by improving yield and yield stability, which could lead to increased profit, by reducing reliance on crop protection inputs um, through reducing weed burdens and pest and disease pressures, and by improving uh, nitrogen and other nutrient use efficiencies that will um, ameliorate pollution issues and runoff and, and nutrient losses. But we do uh, acknowledge that a lot of these benefits and outcomes are context dependent, and that's where we really need more work to understand what conditions lead to the, the best outcomes. So hopefully this has shown how other crops can be used to help legumes get by. Um, but but acknowledge that the way forward invo involves some uh, a sort of mindset shift to, to a more agroecological approach to farming throughout the supply and value chains. Finally, just to thank you all for listening, um, but thank you also to all the partners in the Remix project who've contributed to this and the Diversify project. And of course, to our funders, the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali, for these uh, overall presentations of the intercrop benefits from other European projects. And that's now I give the floor to Nicola and Daniele presenting current and future yields or legumes in Europe. 
So Nicola, I think you have the the floor no, now. But even I, I will be the first. Okay, you will be the first. So Daniele, okay, you have the floor, Daniele. Okay. Mm. Can you see my presentation? Yes, perfect. Is it in full screen? Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, it good. is. Yeah, good morning to, to everyone. Uh, I'm sharing this presentation with Nicola Gitpar from AgroPyritech, but actually this presentation was co-authored by Idis Bertem from Iraq. So I'm going to, to present you uh, a really teamwork, yeah, that was made within the Leg Value project, but also with the collaboration of people external to our uh, consortium. And I want to thank everybody uh, who contributed in this in this work, and especially the Leg Value partners who uh, share a lot of uh, their own data to uh, with us to uh, prepare this uh, this work. So uh, our task in Leg Value was aimed to. Um, yeah, estimate the uh, legume kill potential in uh, in Europe in uh, in terms of uh, um, current but also future climate conditions. This is a uh, 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 really key information for us, but also for the stakeholders because actually um, we we don't really know what what is the potential of legume production in uh, in Europe. This is because uh, Many, many legumes have never been grown in, uh, uh, in many, many places in, uh, in Europe. And so we actually don't know what is their kill potential in, the, in those places. And, uh, and also, um, we, really, uh, we really need to have a precise estimation of legume yield potential to um, establish realistic future scenarios, especially in the light of the uh, climate uh, uh, climate change conditions, so we, we don't really know what is the the exact link between phytoclimatic conditions and the actual uh, performances of the leggings, and also because uh, we we don't know um, also the uh, what's what will be the, the best legume species to be grown in a certain place oh, in the environment. Sorry, like <laughs> sorry, there's some micro open. And uh, um, we we really don't know also what will be the best uh, technical options to grow the legumes in different places. So uh, actually, it, it is quite clear that uh, with less than 5% of the share of agricultural land covered by the legumes, legumes can be considered right now just as mineral crops, but they are uh, really interesting to um, develop the agricultural sector in, in Europe, as also shown by the, the people presenting uh, before me. And uh, uh, so there's a... Um, uh, it, it is a very key information to provide to the stakeholder with to know um, how uh, the, 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 the legumes can be grown in the, in the, in the best way in different, uh, in different climatic conditions. And also, um, we want to uh, stimulate the adoption of legumes by, by the farm. So, to, uh, to come up with uh, um, an, uh, a realistic estimation of the legume hill potential in Europe, we adopted uh, what we consider a really solid approach based on uh, experimental uh, data. So I just give you an example for soybean, but this was applied also to the other legumes included in this work. So basically, we uh, in leg value, we wanted to build up a, a data set comprehensive of all the experimental data produced in Europe on the five major pulse species and based on literature search and experimental data. And we want to, uh, so uh, we, we started with the, um, the field experimental data that were already published in the literature that for sure covered just a very small uh, area uh, of agricultural land in, in Europe. Then we integrated 
the data set with other experimental data that were not published. And uh, uh, in order to um, uh, enlarge the geographical coverage of our data set and to be able to estimate together with uh, uh, climatic data, the uh, potential yield obtained by the legumes in places where legumes are not well represented or never be grown. So to do that, we started first from literature search and we uh, based our research on uh, the most uh, more comprehensive paper published so far, that is the, the paper uh, produced by Cerny and colleagues in 2016 at global level. So including all the legume heal data produced globally um, in uh, uh, scientific papers. And uh, so uh, we uh, restricted the data set produced by Cerny and colleagues to, to the European conditions, to the European countries. And then we updated with the same search strings, the, that, the literature search up to 2018. And then we also included other papers that were not included in our uh, search string that, were, that was a bit modified in order to be more comprehensive because actually we found very, very few papers published specifically on legume meals in, in Europe. Then we also enlarged our data set, including the, uh, the huge uh, experimental uh, field data coming from a past UPFP7 project, is the Legato project that produced a, a, a data set that is publicly available. And then we also ask the lead value partners who are managing um, different networks of field experiments in their own countries to supply our data set with their own unpublished experimental data. So data were produced under experimental conditions. This was really uh, very, very important for us. And then uh, at the end, we obtain a quite large data set, including more than 5,000 yield data produced in 21 countries and the mostly represented by soybean, pea and uh, faba bean, including all the different kinds of uh, faba bean. And uh, this uh, large data set was also presented in a French uh, speaking conference this year and uh, was used by the colleagues from France, especially from Nicolas and Iris, to set up their modeling activities. So now I will leave the floor to, to Nicola, who is going to present you the major outcomes and the, the, the methods used in this modeling exercise. So Nicola, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniele. Um, can you set me as a, the presenter so I can share my screen? Right. Okay, that, that's, that's it now. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Mm. It comes. We have a white screen. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. Well, excuse, well, excuse me, just seems there is something strange. Uh, can you yes. see my screen now? Yes, yes I can see okay. it now. And okay, okay. Yeah. Is it good? Yes, it's good. Well, Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for that. Well, uh, well so the, the, the next step was to, to model the, the grain yield of our grain legumes as a function of climate. And uh, for that, we used the uh, monthly uh, global historical climate data sets. And we used from that data set five variables that are relevant to crop growth, and um, which are the daily minimum and maximum temperature the rainfall, solar radiation, and the reference evapotranspiration. 
Then in the first step, um, we develop a, a, a model that relates the yield to the climate, and we fitted that model using the yield from the European Grain Legume data set, and the model was fitted using a machine learning approach. Uh, this is the random forest algorithm. And in the second step, once the model was fitted, we made yield projection over the whole European area. In total, we fitted nine models, one for soybean and two for pea, faba bean, chickpea, and lentils, because those four crops can be grown either as winter crops or spring crops. Then one quick question be before making the projection is to know whether the model is, is good as predicting yield. And to assess this, we compared um, the yield predicted by the model to the yield observed on data that were not used to train the model. And we can conclude from this that the predictive ability of the model is good. And this conclusion is based on three points. The first one is a good R squared here, which means that 85% of the yield variability in our data set is captured by the model, which is quite good. The second point is the ability of the model to predict from very low yield to very high yield. And the third point is uh, you see that pretty much all points align along the, the one one line, which means that there is uh, almost no bias in the prediction. The model performs better for some crops uh, like uh, winter chickpea or spring lentil, um, but all R square are, are good. Um, um, all R square are good, so you see for all crops, and with the lowest one, which is 0 0.6, so you, you see that uh, uh, the model performs well. Well, then uh, we generated the maps of attainable yield uh, over Europe. Here you have the maps for historical climate over the past 20 years, so that's the average yield over the past 20 years. For spring crops, you have soybean, faba bean, pea, uh, chickpea, and lentil. I'm not going to, to comment in details all those maps, but um, uh, two, two main comments are you see that uh, you, you see some large area with quite good yields that are uh, uh, predicted by the model for most crops. Um, but be careful, we don't have a lot of data for chickpea and lentils, so those results must uh, be interpreted with caution. But the main conclusion here is that the, those yield projections under historical climate suggest a quite good suitability for most crops uh, over Europe. Also, we know that we would need to, to consider other factors to, to, to make a good conclusion, like the relative profitability of other crops or the local adaptation of management practices. But from a biophysical point of view, the, the, the suitability seems quite good. Uh, those are the maps for uh, winter crops. And pretty much the same conclusion apply with a good suitability for most crops over uh, Europe and, uh, and with low data for uh, winter lentil and, and winter chickpea. Well, um, now that we have those maps, uh, the, the question is what can we do with, with these maps? And what I would like to do now is, is to give you a few examples of what we could do um, with those maps. And, uh, uh, and, and I start with a, a first example. Uh, which is about how we could identify areas with uh, high potential that are currently unexplored. And here you have the yield, uh, the average yield for soybean on the left, so over the past 20 years, predicted by the model. And you have a map of soybean area in 2010 uh, in Europe, which is from the SPAM 2010 uh, model. And when you compare the two maps, uh, we can see that there is an, an area with high potential that, that is, in fact, currently unexplored. So this is an area of, of high interest, I think, if we are to increase the share of legumes, and here especially soybean, in, into our cropping system in Europe. The second example is, is how we can help farmers identify the best crops to grow on their farm. And uh, we chose uh, an example uh, where we compare the yield uh, from uh, a spring type and the winter type for for pea, and uh, if we compare the two the two maps that we have here, uh, the two maps that we have here, we can compute the difference, and uh, you see on these maps the area in, in orange where the spring uh, pea gives higher yield, uh, in blue where the winter pea gives higher yield, and in gray where um, the difference is, is quite small. So I think this kind of approach can uh, provide uh, interesting information as well. 
The next example is uh, how we can identify what we call a legume blind spot, which uh, means area in Europe where we were not able to find or access any field experiments that report grain yield. Uh, I took two examples here from uh, Fababin on the left. You see that in the southwest of France and in Spain or in the east of Europe, we have uh, uh, very few or almost no field experiments. And on the, the right side, you see for chickpea that um, all the, the, the field experiments that we collected are concentrated in the south of Europe, which is no surprise, but given climate change expectation, it, it would be interesting, I think, to have uh, uh, some experiments in, uh, at higher latitude. Well, the next uh, example is how we can use this approach to anticipate shifts in suitable areas from climate change. And this is an example from a, a, a previous work, but that, that used a bit different data, but with the same approach. And you have two maps on the, the left. You see uh, the average uh, projected soybean yield over the historical climate. And on the right, you see uh, that the same map, uh, but for the middle of the century, uh, for a, a moderate warming climate change scenario. And you see that we, we can detect some, um, this, this map suggests the shifts uh, toward the northeast uh, for climate suitability for soybean. And I think this kind of in information as well is important to anticipate the effect of climate change. And the last example I, I'm going to, to present is how we can use this map to design and assess scenarios of increasing legume uh, production in Europe. Uh, here you have, this is under historical climate, and, and you can see in blue, given the yield projected by the model, the area that would be required to, read, uh, to reach 100% uh, sufficiency in soybean, or in dark blue, 50% uh, self-sufficiency in soybean, according to two uh, uh, situations, if we grow soybean one year in three or one year in five on, on the right. Well, uh, I, I will not comment uh, any further, but uh, yeah, that was just to uh, show you a few examples of what we, we can do with, with, uh, with those maps. Well, I would like to conclude with a few uh, uh, words of con conclusion. Uh, so the main findings in, in that work is that the data-driven approach that we use is, is good. It's quite good at predicting yields of legume crops. And the uh, uh, projection that we are making suggests there is a high potential for legumes production in Europe under the current climate. And we also can expect important shifts in suitable areas from climate change. So it's for soybean that we will make the analysis for other crops. And we also show that there are important blind spots uh, in the areas with no experiment for legumes in Europe. Uh, so what's next? In the short term, we, we plan to improve the model with the inclusion of soil data uh, regarding soil fertility and water holding capacity. Then we will try to make uh, the field experiment database, the European Grain Legume dataset, and the maps of projected yields uh, publicly available as soon as we can. Uh, and we will use the maps uh, to design scenarios of increasing legume production in Europe, and this will be done within the leg value project. And we also plan to, to uh, run a comparative study of the effects of climate change on, on the five legumes that we have. Then I think this uh, work open uh, raised uh, some perspective and new question like how to fill the identified blind spots, uh, how to use these results that are at a large scale to uh, really help farmers grow more legumes locally. I mean, the local adaptation of, of this is, is still a, a question. And uh, how could these results be useful for the breeding community? So that's uh, one of, of the questions. Um, that are raised by this work. Well, uh, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Daniele and uh, Nicola. And now I give the floor to uh, Paul. Uh, Paul, 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 yes. So I think, Paul, you can go on. Yes, fine. We Do can you see, see my screen? Perfect, yes. Perfect. Well, so good morning, everyone. I'm thank you for inviting me. I'm Paul Belleville from INRAE, and I will present some results from a scenario design exercise that has been carried out uh, with uh, six European countries 
over the last months, and we will try to answer the question, what are the environmental and economic impacts of scaling out <coughs> legume-based cropping and grassland system in Europe? So, it has been stated in the previous presentation that legumes can provide a very wide range of uh, services that can be uh, used, for example, as cash crop, cover crops for feed, food, etc. And they can lead to very various performance and services depending on how they are used. So in the near future, this system, including more legumes, will probably uh, scale out following driving forces from market, policies, technological advance, and things like that. And yet, legume development can, leg can lead to various results. For example, if we think about um, GMO soybean or organic alfalfa, we do not have the same landscapes. So there is a need to explore contrasted scenario to highlight how legumes um, might be used and to assess these scenarios at large scales. Here we tried to, uh, to go at EU scale to quantify aggregated benefits of such systems. So first, uh, I will uh, present uh, the method we, uh, we developed. So it's a three-step uh, method using data from national on-farm networks, public statistics, and expert knowledge. So we conducted the senior design approach, exploring four contrasted um, socioeconomic contexts. And these scenarios are based on country scale workshop involving stakeholders from the six European countries that are France, Germany, Latvia, Lithuania, the Netherlands, and Switzerland. So first, for each country, we described families or clusters of cropping systems that share common uh, characteristics, and we established their current distribution across arable lands. Then we organized one workshop per country, and we asked stakeholders of the legume value chain to imagine new distributions of these cropping systems across the arable land. And then we uh, assess each of these distributions at different scales, at national scales and aggregated uh, scale. So here is a focus on what I uh, call a cropping system cluster or a cropping system family. So uh, it is not possible to describe all the diversity of cropping system for, um, uh, for our uh, workshop. So we decided to gather them in groups, we call them families, and we uh, each country has its own set of uh, uh, cropping systems. They represent dominant and innovative cropping systems with and without legumes, uh, crop only or with grasslands. So we have a, quite a big, uh, a large diversity of cropping system to uh, play with. And all of these cropping systems have been distributed according to these four um, contexts. So these contexts have been designed by another Lake Value work package, and you can um, read about them in Derivable 5.2, which is publicly available on the Lake Value website. And here we go very briefly through them. So they describe four uh, prospective possible future situations but regarding trade barriers, and environmental concerns. On the top, uh, you have a tribes and citizen context, uh, which promotes inclusive growth. And the tribe uh, context uh, is more focused on nationalism with trade barriers, and citizen uh, has more free trade rules. On the bottom, you have uh, the complete opposite with multinational and consumer context which are more focused on uh, what we call regonomics, which are hard capitalism, maximum profitability, no environmental concerns. And again, you have a gradient of freedom uh, given to trade. 
So then we assessed the performance of the distributions elaborated by uh, stakeholders during the workshop using uh, three terms. So these terms have been decided, uh, we decided to use these terms according to the data uh, that was provided. And we used Eurostat, fee tables and CQL tables as references uh, at crop level. So we have a uh, nitrogen term uh, that includes crude protein harvested, overall uh, crude protein harvested, and overall nitrogen fertilizer use. We also have an energy term um, in which we look at calorific, calorific value harvested and energy used to make the mineral nitrogen fertilizer used. And also we um, have a look at the value uh, what we call gross revenue at current selling price and uh, nitrogen fertilizer cost. Then we, we look at efficiencies uh, within each of these teams and sometimes balance. So these indicators are defined at crop within cro uh, cropping system cluster level and they are then aggregated at territory and uh, European scale using an area weighted average based on the land devoted to each cropping system character. So what participants have actually done during workshop is to change the weight uh, given to a particular uh, cropping uh, system cluster. Now moving on to the results of uh, this method. Here I present uh, a plot where you can see the share of legumes within each scenario. So this is uh, an aggregated result for the six countries. Uh, what we can see from uh, that figure is that context with inclusive growth, which are citizen and tribes context, as um, really the most favorable context for legume development. Uh, we can reach uh, more than 15% of uh, arable land dedicated to legume within each of these contexts. And this development is mainly driven by forage legumes such as alfalfa and clover, papa bean, protein pea, and soybean. Dry pulses for human only consumption, uh, like lentil, chickpea, uh, and sometimes beans, also develop a lot. Uh, like you can see currently, uh, they are not even represented in the statistic we had, but they can represent a noticeable share in the end. Context with trade barriers and little environmental concerns, which is here the multinational one, uh, is not really a suitable context for legume development. It increases a little, and the development is mainly driven by soybean in this case. In the end, the consumer uh, context is not favorable at all for legume development. In fact, we even decrease the share of Arab and land uh, dedicated to legume. As a reminder, in this context, we have free trade and no environmental concern at all. So when we look at uh, the assessment indicators I presented to you earlier, uh, we can compare them and have a, a view on the global changes. So here I will focus on the nitrogen team because we won't have the time to go through all uh, indicators. And in this table, you can see changes in nitrogen fertilizer use and protein production relative to current situations. Um, so none of the scenario that was quite interesting increase the amount of total protein harvested, even in the case where we have more than 15% on legume uh, in arable land. Uh, this is because protein content of legume is very high compared to cereals, but the yield relatively to cereals is also very low. So overall, if you increase the share of uh, legumes by removing oil seed crops and cereals, uh, you do not change that much to share of the amount of protein, uh, crude protein you create. However, what changes a lot is the amount of nitrogen fertilizer used to make this protein. And here we had up to a minus 31% of reduction of nitrogen fertilizer spread. 
So inclusive growth context, so here citizens and tribes are much more efficient when it comes to uh, creating protein uh, for the future. Also, even if uh, we do not change the overall amount of protein uh, produced, it's quite interesting to see that the origin of the protein change within each uh, scenario. Uh, in inclusive growth scenarios, forage legumes become a great protein source. As you can see here, it can represent up to 16% uh, and 11% of the overall protein, crude protein production. And while uh, protein sources such as cereals, faba beans, soybean can be very easily exchanged on international markets, forage tends to be produced and consumed on the same place, roughly. So I totally agree with you uh, that it's not enough because we do not uh, analyze the demand, but this is a good point uh, for protein self-sufficiency. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, we have been through four extreme contexts for legume development. Uh, some say they are not even realistic, that's quite true, but they are a good way to uh, go further and think out of the box. And despite this major increase in the legume share with current yield, protein production does not increase. And in fact, it decreases a little. But these changes could lead to a much, much better nitrogen efficiency because we will use far less uh, nitrogen fertilizer to produce the same amount of protein. And that is possible if context is favorable to uh, inclusive growth policies. Uh, the method presented here uh, can be used at smaller scale, like regional level, with more accurate data to promote discussion and exchanges between stakeholders. That's very interesting when you want to uh, um, make uh, private companies and farmers to discuss and meet, because it does not require to um, give critical strategic information about companies. Uh, before I end my presentation, I would like to say a very special thanks to all partners involved in this workshop, because they did a very fantastic job at organizing this despite the COVID-19 crisis. So thank you very much to them. Well, for all of you listening, do not hesitate to leave your question on the chat. I will do my best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. So, Enric, I give you the floor now. Uh, thank you, marie uh, Could you maybe um, put up your slide on um, on this discussion point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. While while you are working on the um, on your computer, I will just uh, say that it's a quarter past 12 now so we missed out about 15 minutes but i think it was worth it because we learned uh, a lot from uh, many different uh, perspectives uh, dealing with uh, the optimization of legume production um, we have tried to um, to get some activity on the chat and i think it's improving so please don't hesitate to uh, to come up with your questions, your your comments on on um, on the chat, and as we said for the introduction, we will uh, we will uh, download all the information that we have from the chat, and uh, the different speakers will, if needed, uh, answer directly to your questions uh, later on. Um, from discussion with uh, Mari Helen, and uh, also the aim of this um, uh, webinar. Uh, there is a there is an ongoing discussion on uh, uh, moving and this optimization. What does it mean? Uh, we have some like indicated in several uh, presentations. We have some we could call them scientific challenges uh, that we need to address. But we also have a lot of issues on um, on uh, implementation. Uh, we can see that the area dropped, uh, even though the potential for growing the the need for increased focus on ecosystem functions and services are there, but it's not really used used uh, to the level that uh, at least some of us see. 
possible. So um, I, will, I don't know whether it's possible for people to raise their hand or just take your microphone because I think maybe just because we are more than 100 now uh, attending, so maybe I'll just ask uh, within the core group of the presenters uh, how you see this uh possible increased synergy between uh, like scientific um, communities and uh, farmers practitioners how can we uh, improve the interactions uh, between these uh, networks and do you do you have any comments on how you see the potential in this is it already going on or is it or do you see this as a, as another approach to think about optimization and normally, Helen, you'll probably have a reflection on that, but I will just leave you quiet for a moment and then I will ask the rest of the presenters here. Yes, I can just uh, uh, give you a few words about that uh, before people um, say something. I think that uh, we have to do that. We have to increase the synergy between between research and farmers. Because, bo because both have to learn from the others. And I think we have several methods to do that. We have uh, uh, methods about uh, on-farm innovation tracking to better identify and to analyze the innovations from farmer. We have methods about co-design. We have methods uh, to design the tailored uh, ways of growing legumes. We have are you trying to know how to go to the to which to which future and um, and uh, yes we have also a, a modeling approach uh, based on expert knowledge also and we have also uh, uh, tools to mix to hybridize uh, scientific and expert knowledge to do that so i i think we have several methods in hand to do that but uh, the the question is is uh, do you think uh, that it it is uh, possible uh, to do that there uh, are there uh, obstacles to do that and uh, how we can do that so may, maybe you have something to add about that Maybe I can uh, reflect on this. Yes, yes yeah. thanks, Chris. I was about to uh, point my finger at you. <laughs> yeah, because I think uh, um, that if, if you look at um, innovation, then innovation, of course, is the result of a very complex uh, um, uh, system. Uh, it's not only uh, scientific knowledge and knowledge produced by farmers. It's also the... Um, uh, uh, the position of all kinds of stakeholders, including uh, uh, governments and uh, value chain companies and NGOs that also play a, uh, an important role in this. Uh, so, in fact, I think this question is about transition. And transition, of course, is a very complex uh, system and it's not um, an easy um, balance between science and, um, and farmers. So I think it's more complex. But Chris, uh, how do you fuel such a transition? I mean, how, well, what's think, your recommendation? Yeah, yeah. The, I think um, uh, the most important thing is that you um, look at the socio-economic context and that uh, you um, uh, um, place incentives or um, uh, uh, instruments that are in accordance with the uh, socio-economic conditions. I think that is very important. So markets play a role. Uh, the, the society plays a role, and these are these are two are also very much interlinked. So I think it is um, very much um, uh, uh, the question of uh, the right timing and the right tool at the right time. Um, uh, and uh, so it's it's not an easy um, uh, thing that if I put information forward from a science uh, perspective, which I am that then farmers will take it up and say, OK, thank you, I will uh, do that. Uh, yes. and, and the other way around, uh, the same, of course. Yes, thank so you. It's, it's more complex. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Leonora, a direct question to you. I mean, you had this excellent uh, review you presented. 
this about the social economic context and, and and the farmer approach how do you see this in your comprehensive uh, review work yeah well the first thing is that we we included um these sort of social services socially related ecosystem services in our um, list of terms that we searched for in the literature and we got basically no no papers back dealing with those um, services. So there were a few studies that looked at the economic impacts um, and a few looking at, um, yeah, sort of, sort of fuel efficiency, things related to labor. Um, but the, generally, all of what Chris was just talking about is missing from this approach of ecosystem services, at least. Um, so the, there's a huge opportunity there to fill in gaps on on those um, fronts in the research as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Marie Helen, time is running. I think we have five minutes uh, left. Maybe I could have a final question to my Danish colleague uh, Inga. Just a one minute uh, for you, Inga. How do you see this? Uh, approach uh, you are within a uh, research institution but very much connected to extension services in denmark i mean how how is this local approach addressed currently is it do you see any new activities new ways of addressing it or is it something that is already established uh, do you think in your organization for instance <clears throat> well, I, we are actually not a research organization, but we are the Farmers Union's innovation platform. Uh, and um, yeah, as I see it, uh, there's developing a lot of things locally uh, around, I think, especially the, the growing for plant-based foods. Uh, and it's not at this moment uh, very big in Denmark, at least not the growing of the crops. Uh, but we see uh, new companies establishing themselves, and, and we have had a survey uh, at the, um, the consumers that actually point out that they are interested in buying Danish uh, products uh, based on, on Danish uh, grain legumes. So uh, as I see it, uh, we, we have a, a great uh, job to do to support uh, the, the farmers in the new uh, growing of either its its new uh, crops, as I showed earlier, that we actually last year for the first time uh, grew chickpeas. Uh, and it's also the, the w new ways of using the crops. And I think it's, it's very much to do with uh, making the value chains work. Uh, and it's, it's quite new value chains in most cases when we're talking about plant-based. Okay, thank you. Uh, Marie Helene, I think uh, I will give the floor to you with maybe uh, a few final slides and then uh, I will thank, thank you all for contributing. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Henrik, and thank you for co-hosting this webinar. So I would like first to thank you all uh, the presenters uh, for these uh, excellent presentations and I, I hope that uh, everybody enjoyed uh, the webinar this morning. We have had uh, some uh, really rich information on uh, satisfied ways to grow legumes in different, different legumes in different countries. And we have also uh, various uh, research issues and research avenues uh, for uh, uh, future uh, projects and, you, and maybe European projects. <clears throat> so as a final, yes, final uh, two final slides just one uh, to announce uh, the other webinars from uh, this series of webinar the next one will be on value chains and then we have uh, you have other other webinars uh, that uh, you can possibly attend to so do not hesitate to do that on different uh, topics and uh, the final slide only uh, to promote the next webinar, which is uh, really in close link with the webinar from this morning, because this morning was focused on the production, but we have all seen that the production cannot increase without the value chain. So the next webinar will be around the, this value chain uh, from, from the farm gate and the market beyond. Uh, which will 
will be well in which there will be different presentations uh, also and i uh, really encourage you to uh, attend and participate to this uh, next webinar so uh, well enjoy the like value webinar series and uh, also enjoy your next meal maybe based on legume i hope Thank you very much to all of you, and uh, we will try to answer the questions uh, that you ask in the chat. Thank you very much.